going to begin with two assumptions. Number one, that most every one of you was a teenager. And number two, that you can remember being a teenager. <laughs> so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Nobody's going to run up and baptize you while you do it. <laughs> and I want you to think back to one or two of those horrible experiences you cannot get out of your mind today where you did something so stupid, so idiotic, that was so embarrassing, where somebody may have been hurt or could have been hurt in your teenage years. Now, on the left is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. At the time this picture was taken, he was known as Lou Al Cinder, remarkable basketball player out of Power Memorial High School in New York City. On your right is me, Remark <laughs> remarkable only to my mother. But in a playground in northern New Jersey, when he and I were 16 years old, with 400 kids hanging around that playground every Friday and Saturday night, half of them girls, I decided that my two friends and I could whip him and his two buddies in a three-on-three -three game on the playground. <laughs> I have searched the English language, and I have searched every dictionary I could find. And there is no word whose definition is humiliation times 10. And if you have never had the privilege of eating a leather basketball for 25 minutes, I don't recommend it to you. But I'm not here to talk about three-on-three -three pickup basketball games. There is a line in Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities that I have always remembered before Tom Wolfe wrote it because he wasn't the author of it. The author of the line was Judge Saul Wachtler, former chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals in the state of New York, the highest court in that state. And in an interview, Judge Wachtler said, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if that's what the prosecutor wanted. That has stuck with me and a lot of my friends for a long time for the message it may send. But I was a little skeptical that he'd push the envelope when he said that. So my staff and I scoured the prisons in every state in this country, and we could not find a single ham sandwich <laughs> serving time in this country. But what we did find were thousands upon thousands of children just like the one you're looking at. A 14-year-old headed off to prison for over 20 years. Thousands upon thousands. This country leads the world in incarcerating its own people. This country now is determined to incarcerate its children at the same rate it incarcerates its adults. Now, when I say it's children, am I talking about my children? My children aren't in prison. I'm talking about your children? Your children probably aren't in prison. Who are these children? Where are they? And if we don't know them, why do we care? What difference does it make to us if we don't know these kids? Every state in the country has been doing it since the early 1990s. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, familiar to probably a great many in this room, German theologian, executed in 1945 in a Nazi concentration camp when he was hanged. He said that the test of the morality of a society is what it does for its children. He didn't say my children. He didn't say your children. He meant all the children. That's the test of morality to Bonhoeffer. So move from 1945 to now. The 13-year-old boy walks into the living room, and he says to his father reading the newspaper, he said, Dad, I need the keys to the car. I've got a date tonight. And Dad looks up from the paper and smiles and goes back to the paper. And the boy says, I'm serious. And he is serious. And he does know right from wrong. But he said, Dad, I've ridden with you thousands of times. I know if I put the key in the ignition, it'll start the car. I know the steering wheel makes it go left, makes it go left, right, or forward. I know if I put my foot on the brake, I can slow it down or stop it. I know how the turn signals work. And I've got $4 from Mom to put gas in it. And the dad looks up, and he says, no. And his government says, no. Why? Why do they say no? The 14-year-old girl walks into the kitchen where mom's cooking and says, Mom, you know that boy in the eighth grade with me? I've mentioned him before. And she says, I've heard you mention him several times. You must like him a lot. And she says, we're going to get married. And mom looks up from the cooking, smiles, and goes back to cooking. And she says, I'm serious. We love each other. And you know I reached puberty two years ago. And we want to have a family and raise children. And I've watched you do it. So we're going to do the same thing. <clears throat> and while we're at it, I need some money to buy a house. <laughs> and 
And mom says to the girl, no. And the government says to the girl, no. But why? Why do they say no? Is it so obvious that we're sitting here, we know why we're saying no? There is an ad for a health care company that makes it simple. They want you to bring your children to them for health care. And they say kids are not little adults. So what is Hancock's doing up here? Tell us something we don't already know. And then a national automobile insurance company comes out with a different ad. Why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing a part of their brain? Because they are. What does that mean? That's a little more esoteric than kids are not little adults. In 1948, 65 years ago, the United States Supreme Court was confronted with a problem of a 15-year-old who was accused of something serious and was interrogated in the early morning hours for hours and hours by police and had nobody helping him. And the United States Supreme Court said no. The United States Supreme Court said we can't tolerate that. And what did they say? Age 15 is a tender and difficult age for a boy of any race. He cannot be judged by the more exacting standard of maturity. This is a period of great instability, which the crisis of adolescence produces. So on we go. And in the 1980s, this country becomes obsessed with incarcerating its own people. The estimates now are between 2.3 to 2.5 million Americans in our prisons. No country in the world comes close to incarcerating people at the rate we do. And then in the 1990s, we decided, why not house the kids in prison just like we do the adults? They did something bad. We know they knew right from wrong. And on it came up to this day. So you go back to the United States Supreme Court. They haven't said anything since 1948 about this situation. And while we're incarcerating our children at the same rate we're incarcerating our adults, happy to lead the world for some reason, there is another group of people who are trying to get the answer to the why. And those people are doctors, researchers, scientists, pediatricians, child therapists, caseworkers all around the country. Why are these children different? Why is it that the 13-year-old can drive the car. He could. But when he looks out the window and sees his high school buddy, or his junior high school buddy, and he gets distracted, he runs over the three-year-old in the street and kills him. Why does a 14-year-old girl, who's now 15, gets a call on the cell phone from her best friend talking about how nice the history teacher is, and forgets that the bathtub's running, and this new infant drowns? Why does that happen with children? The American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Association of Child Psychologists, the researchers, the scientists came up and studied and studied, and this is what they studied, the human brain. Everybody recognizes that sketch of the human brain. That's simple. But what was it they found? What they found was the adult brain on the left as opposed to the adolescent, the child or the juvenile brain on the right has a frontal lobe or a frontal cortex, but the one with the child isn't near developed. It won't develop till the child is 20, 21, 22. So when they're in their teens, that frontal lobe and that frontal cortex hasn't developed. What difference does that make? Because that is the CEO of the brain. That is the part of the brain that they then realize controls decision-making, it controls mature judgment, it controls the ability to resist impulse, and it controls the ability to resist the influences of people around you. And what they concluded was, children do not appreciate the consequences of their acts the way adults do. Children do not engage in decision-making the way adults do. Nobody else in the country would listen to all these experts. And my friend uses an example where everybody surrounds home plate in Little League. And the doctors come to home plate, and they bring the x-ray technicians, and everybody agrees the kid's leg is broken. Only the government would say, who cares? Run to first base, kid. Despite the conclusive medical, they tell the United States Supreme Court because that's the only place they go. And for those of you who aren't aware of it, the United States Supreme Court could be very, very concerned. But if there isn't something in the United States Constitution that they can base a decision on, they can do nothing. 
I don't know how many of you, if I asked you to stand up and tell me what the Eighth Amendment to the Bill of Rights says, because that's what they went to. And the Eighth Amendment to the Bill of Rights that the United States Supreme Court turned to says this, nor are cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And the United States Supreme Court said to Jacksonville, Florida, that 16-year-old you sent to life in prison with no parole when he didn't even hurt anybody, that is cruel and unusual in the 21st century under our Constitution. And what the Supreme Court did over the next few years was continue to send the message to the governments of this country. And their irresponsible conduct is not as morally reprehensible as that of, as that of an adult. 2005. In 2011, a child's age is a fact that generates common sense conclusions about behavior and perception, and they are self-evident to anyone who's once a child, child wants himself. That's exactly what they said in 1948. They just didn't know why they were saying it in 1948. And then, <clears throat> developments in psychology and brain science continue to show fundamental differences between juvenile and adult minds. Did our governments listen? No. That steamroller keeps on moving right to this day. First-hand experience, 12 years old, home alone with his two-year-old brother. He hurts his brother. As soon as he realized he hurt his brother, he calls his mother to come home. She does. She takes his 12-year-old to school, and unfortunately, for whatever reasons, legitimate or illegitimate, she doesn't seek medical care for eight and a half hours. And 36 hours after she does get the medical care, the two-year-old dies from brain swelling. Never intended by this 12-year-old. Never intended. The government's solution to that problem was to indict that child for first-degree murder as an adult. And if he had been found guilty of that when he was indicted, he would serve every day of the rest of his life in an adult prison. Now, did that child end up going to adult prison? No. We'd like to say it was because of an army of legal talent. We'd like to say it was because the judge heard from experts around the country and read what the United States Supreme Court said and said, this kid's not a ham sandwich. But I will get back to what I think was the major reason in a moment. The child is interrogated in the early morning hours by an experienced homicide detective. Six constitutional rights he's told. Six times he's asked if he understands them, and six times he says, uh-huh. He's told he has a right to a lawyer. He's never heard what a lawyer does in his life, and nobody tells him. What he says could be used against him in court. He doesn't know what a court is. But my favorite... The next one says, if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed for you before any question, if you wish. That means if you don't have money for a lawyer, which I know you're 12, so that would be your mom, you know, responsibility to get a lawyer for you. Um, if you don't have the money for one, that we will give you one. You understand what that means? Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason that's my favorite is because if you can't afford one, you're 12, your mom's got the response. Mom's locked up down the hallway, and they won't let her see her son. And they won't let her son see his mom. So why are you telling him this? Because he's 12 years old, and he won't understand. And if you think the insurance ad missing a part of a brain of a 16-year-old is the case, how, where do you think a 12-year-old is? So we continue to lock these kids up throughout the country. That one spent 23 days in an adult jail in solitary confinement when it started. Now, we live in a system of justice that has decision makers who relate to relative affluence and do not relate to poverty. They relate to education, high school, college. They do not relate to illiteracy. And they relate to relatively safe neighborhoods. They don't relate to a 15-year-old praying. He makes that last four blocks when he gets off the school bus today, and they don't take his money or his backpack because he didn't make it yesterday. But one thing that is a common denominator is rich, poor, educated, illiterate, safe or unsafe, is none of these kids' brains have developed. To be responsible, like the United States Supreme Court says, you can't punish them the way you do the rest of them. In the last speech he gave before he died, this is what was on former Vice President Hubert Humphrey's mind. The moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life the children. Go back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What are the three things in common? Decades earlier, he said. He said, you protect the children, number one. Number two, Bonhoeffer said society. Humphrey says government. Did they mean the same thing? We'll never know because they're not around to ask. But the moral test, they agree that it is a moral test. They didn't say legal test. 
And so if you go back to your home and you look in the mirror, whether you're going to brush your teeth, you're going to shave, or you just like admiring yourself in the mirror, <laughs> ask yourself, do I subscribe to a moral test? And I suspect you'll say you do. Do I teach my children a moral test? I'm sure you think you do. But is it meaningful for all of us if you don't demand that same moral test of the people you elected to represent you and run this government? And in closing, I will say that I believe sometimes pictures can be worth a thousand words. I mentioned earlier that he got lucky. People are asked at the end of talks, well, what can I do? And if somebody says, write your legislator, your governor, your senator, whatever, I say that's hogwash. They have people who are paid to write you back and thank you for that letter and tell you how much they're interested in your input. And nothing changes. The best thing that happened to that child is the media. And that's what I believe changes government, is when the media champions a cause. And they champion his cause in this town, in the state, and in many parts of the rest of the country. Welcome to your new roommate. And then the toughest of all, these two. Bonhoeffer and Humphrey were right. It's a moral test. Thank you.